Let me get started. Uh, first of all, I want to thank thank you for showing up to this uh, second live stream I'm doing. Um, we did one the other night, myself and Thomas, and we um, we discussed uh, perspective and. Uh, okay, good. Yeah, Thomas, just let me know it's the screen. Good to go. All right, so I can I can get started here. I wanted to uh, first of all apologize to everyone that did show up to the first one. And there was a chat window going that I wasn't really aware of. So this is new to me. And it looks like all that chat may have been lost. I don't know if it is saved somewhere. So hopefully we're going to be able to capture that and possibly maybe uh, copy it into the comments to the uh, recorded video for, for later. So if anyone wants to contact me that knows what to do with the chat window and those contents and how that can possibly be saved, please uh, get a hold of me. So, um, all right, I'm going to start now and uh, just, you know, introduce you to my channel if you haven't been here before and uh, talk a little bit about what I see other people doing with their channels. And that is to let people know to subscribe. And if you like the content on someone's channel, make sure you hit that little bell there. And if you're doing it on your smartphone, again, you can subscribe. And again, check that bell. <clears throat> and that's the only way you're going to get uh, notifications of uh, new content being put up there, which I'm, I'm planning to, let me hide this little thing here. Okay, so, um, you know, I'm definitely planning future videos and possibly more live streams um, so go ahead. Let me get started with, uh, oh, and here, I just wanted to say, you know, that was an old, that was an old, uh, screen capture. I was at 281 subscribers. As of today, I've got 337 people following what I'm doing here. And I really appreciate that. Thank you. So, um, and as you can see here, I've got, I got, you know, a decent amount of content up here. These are uh, tests that I do personally. All these videos are the things that I'm doing. Uh, I'm not, you know, you know, this is this is my work. So, um, you know, feel free to tell us about it. Uh, pass it on if if this type of thing interests you. And I'd like to hear from you too if there are things uh, that you'd be interested in seeing me do. I'm just trying to do very simple tests. And uh, lately, you know, the last several that I've done. I'm capturing just pictures or video through the telescope of my theodolite and um, you know, trying to get across to you what I'm able to see. And, um, you know, that's it. So that's that's what I've been doing on this channel. Uh, let's uh, get started with today's event, or this uh, live stream is all about this whole topic of where's the curve. And you've probably seen these types of memes out there on Facebook or or you know, in other locations on YouTube or whatever. Um, here's another one. <clears throat> Actually, to me, uh, these are probably good topics to, to the one on the right here, uh, Lake Pontchartrain Causeway in uh, Louisiana. That'd be a good topic to do a video on. And the same thing for this bridge. Um, but uh, I'd have to do some research, get the uh, construction reports, get the uh, geodetic survey control reports, um, and uh, that type of thing. So I could do some research and uh, and do another video just on, on this alone. So continuing here, where's the curve? The curvature is uh, right in front of your eyes. So here is a, a, a picture that I've been using lately quite a bit, uh, taken through my T2 theodolite along the Delaware Bay of a lighthouse off in the distance. Um, so, and I present here the information. It's the uh, telescope crosshair. The horizontal hair is at 11.6 feet and the uh, lighthouse is at 59 feet high. And I don't think that that's been getting across to people. Now, <clears throat> we discussed this quite a bit on the uh, live stream on Tuesday. But I kind of think the reason I wanted to make this video tonight or this uh, presentation is that I, I don't think I'm really getting across to people what what we're actually looking at here. So I really thought about trying to present this in a little different way. So let's do that. And, and you know, that's what I'm going to do next is 
let's look at this sideways. All right. Now, you're most of you uh, following this whole flat Earth topic are very familiar with this chart. So we're, what we're doing here is we're looking at this picture. Let me back up. We're taking this picture and we're turning it sideways. And so if I put the theodolite there and I produce a line of sight outward from that theodolite to create the tangent line, the horizontal tangent at this location, which is basically what, what this line is on the chart, okay? Uh, the uh, calculations that you make here on the chart are measured downward from that line. And, uh, and the other thing that's shown here is the curvature, the actual uh, arc of curvature, and it's labeled there as theta. So let's continue on. This is uh, basically what I'm hoping will uh, present this in a, in a way that, you know, makes this picture make more sense to you. So let's, let's continue. Right, I'm kind of repeating here. Just uh, bear with me. So let me move on. This is an important uh, little video that I have captured. I, I took a segment of this video and shared it on my channel. How is the horizontal tangent established? Let, let's listen to this. Hopefully this is going to bring up this video and give a listen. All right, I apologize, folks. I just got a message uh, that uh, the uh, volume was very low on that. And I guess that's because I've got headphones on and that sound was coming out of my speakers. Tell you what, um, I'm going to move on. I'm not going to belabor this. It, it, it's, it's well worth going back and looking at that uh, video later. It just describes essentially what what the theodolite does, how the uh, horizontal circle has to be leveled and established to be uh, perpendicular to the vertical. And all the angles get measured from that reference. I'm going to keep going here. So I've made this sketch uh, just to kind of break this down for you. The, uh, what you're seeing here is, is the theodolite over on the left, and it's set up and it's perpendicular to the vertical plumb line there. And the telescope is set to be horizontal. And that is, it forms a 90 degree angle here to create this horizontal plane. Now here you have some distant, uh, any object out in the distance uh, that can be seen. You can actually see it, okay? But the information that you get from the curvature chart, that drop of the curve is measured from here. It can be measured along the uh, vertical direction at that location, or it can be measured at right angles to that horizontal plane. The difference between those two numbers is going to be very small when you're talking about things that are way off in the distance at 30 and 40 and 50 miles. And then, of course, we're talking about the difference in those two plumb lines you could look at that as the curvature. You could look at it as the tilt, the angular tilt between these two vertical references. And again, that's labeled as theta on the curvature chart. Okay. Uh, one more thing I'll just mention here, I don't have it scripted or, or, or written up here, is that at this point on Earth, you have a latitude and a longitude. And at this place on the Earth, you have a latitude and a longitude. Um, to get this theta, you could do roughly what you might consider a Pythagorean theorem, which is the delta x 
squared and the delta y squared, you sum those, you take the square root, right? So that's Pythagorean theorem. You could do the same thing with latitudes and longitudes. Roughly, you could take the difference in latitude in decimal degrees, let's say, square it, take the difference in longitude square and square that and sum those and then take the square root of that and that will roughly give you this uh this arc all right so and again i mentioned this before we're not looking at high precision we're not looking at millimeters we're not looking at inches we're you know we're looking for hundreds of feet of drop here so you know if you if you if you kind of round things off to the nearest uh, couple of feet in, in you know in when you're looking at this data you know don't don't sit here and squabble over oh he's you know he's off by a, an inch or two that that's not what we're trying to do uh, across these uh, long distances and again so so if you round off your uh, angular measurement there you know to the nearest couple of minutes or something it's ad adequate for um for what we're discussing here Okay, so the curvature is clearly visible. So now I, I've taken that side view and I've brought it back to the straight on view where you're standing at the shore, uh, you know, and you're looking out and you've established the tangent line with the Theodolite telescope. And, uh, you know, there it is right there. And How about now? How about now? Crap. Check, check. Okay, I'm back. <laughs> All right. Well, tell me what I should, sound is back on. Tell me where, where I should uh, pick up from. I'll, I'll gladly just back up a little bit. Anyway, I'll keep going. And then, Thomas, you could let me know if there's anything you think I should come back to to clarify that. Start of this slide. OK. OK, so yeah, so uh, hopefully you caught all of this uh, explanation of what this chart is. And, uh, and then what I proceeded with, and I guess the sound dropped, I'm telling you that the, the curvature is clearly visible now that you know. Uh, it's a 20 second delay. All right, sorry, folks. I will um, proceed slowly. I've got a pretty good uh, internet connection here. Well, maybe there is something to say about just making videos then. I thought the live streams would, uh, would be a good thing to do. But uh, anyway, this is my second one, and uh, we're playing with it. So again, the curvature here is cl clearly visible once you know what you're really looking at. And hopefully that side view brought it together so that you understand that this is that tangent line at ele and in this case it's at 11.6 feet and um, the uh, that 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 lighthouse out there on the navigate on the nautical chart is labeled as 59 feet high yet it's below this 11.6 feet uh, tangent line and uh, so you know, it, it, you, you start to see the curvature like this, okay? Now you start to understand. So it's essential to create 
a line, some tangent line, and you, you have to use an instrument to do that. And I'm going to show you some other ways of achieving that, you know, if you, you know, obviously not everybody has surveying equipment. So there's other ways to do this. All right. So again, viewing from the side, we already reviewed this. All right. Um, I just got a message of people on the chat. I'm glad to hear it. Um, and uh, thanks for joining in to watch. And of course, this will be recorded and on my channel for later viewing. Uh, what I want to talk about here is let's start talking about the reality of how far you can see, all right? How far can we really see? I have no qualms with the, uh, well, here, let's, let me go through it like this. You know, 3,000 feet, 3,000 miles, 2,000 miles, 1,000 miles, uh, you know, that's just not real. You know, we're not able to see that far with a theodolite or not even a Nikon P900 is going to, you know, zoom out to 1,000 miles. You know, it's just not happening. Uh, however, this geometry is correct in the chart. You know, you can do this in AutoCAD and calculate these things, but you're not going to see it. All right. So let's let's proceed with this idea of getting a perspective on the reality of how far we can actually see. And uh, I hope that the person who made this chart, uh, you know, doesn't mind me sharing this here. It's out on the internet. I don't know that person, but I'm definitely putting the attribution here that they made this chart. And uh, you notice they have, he's got down here at the bottom, some magnification. So let's zoom in and look at this in the uh, tens of miles. Now we're talking about nominally how far you can possibly see with, with a theodolite. And I'm going to show you that in a little bit. Uh, the surveying measurements that are made or used to be made long ago when we did geodetic triangulation. Um, that's that's way in the past. Uh, now that GPS is here, everything's done with GPS, GNSS. Uh, these are the old days, but uh, I'll show you that in a little bit. Let's let's get real here. What we're talking about, little chunk of earth right there, and that's where you can, you know, see out there using cameras, using uh, theodolites and what have you. In some cases, uh, and, and let me let me mention this too, that uh, these lines of sight don't exist. These thousands of miles, they're just not possible anywhere. Um, some places you have hundreds of miles that are visible, you know, out there at one to two, you know, maybe 300 miles or so, but that's about it. You're not going to go thousands and thousands of miles. Now, here's a place I, I, I was interested to find out, well, where is the longest sight line on Earth? I found this, and there are others. I mean, you, you, you can find other places in the world where they could see 100, 200 and some miles. This, this happens to be about 237 miles. I'm just going to click on this to bring up that little, uh, this little blog. And uh, I'm going to translate it. I'll put the links to all this in the description. So apparently they went out here and photographed the sun way off in the distance, you know. And I, I didn't read this whole thing, but, it, you know, it looks like they're claiming this could possibly be a, a world record uh, of sighting that far. So I, I just wanted to include that to get across the idea that uh, you can only see so far. All right, so when you're looking at that chart, understand what you're really able to do with that chart. Now, here's the triangulation diagram for uh, Michigan, a geodetic control diagram, just a portion of Lake Michigan. And you may recognize this uh, sight line across here uh, where Red Pill World, he saw 54 miles across the lake. And I detailed this a little bit, or I, I, I mentioned it a good deal in this video I did called Flat Earth Proof, Show Us the Measurements. You can find that on my channel, and I, and I talk about this line. And by the way, I do have plans to go here and replicate that test. I, I just want to see that for myself. I think it's pretty cool. Uh, but anyway, on this triangulation diagram, 
you could see they actually measured from that triangulation station to the Sears Tower and they saw about 41 miles. And here they saw, you know, about 28 miles across the lake. Most of these other triangulation uh, triangles, all these observations, are, aren't even that long. They're, they're at maybe 10 to 20 miles, you know, stuff like that. Um, here's the uh, state of Kansas, the uh, triangulation diagram for the whole state of Kansas, which I do plan to do a video on this because you hear about how flat Kansas is. I do plan to uh, go into the details of this, but uh, just to check this out. Here's some triangulation lines that were observed. They do them in quadrilaterals like that. And then of course they chain these together and just kind of move across the state. And that's what you're looking at is arcs of triangulation that, you know, are all tied together. And each one of these little triangles is generally one of these brass discs set in concrete. Um, I meant to include uh, the uh, Bilby Steel Towers that they erected. I mean, these these observations were made, you know, could be as high as 100 feet in the air, because um, that's that's what it took to see that far. So, yeah, if you uh, if you just do a little search on Bilby Steel Tower, you'll find. Uh, in fact, on my channel, I've got a uh, a little video of them erecting a Bilby steel tower. And, uh, you know, like I said, they would go about anywhere from 80 to 100 and sometimes even a little higher, 120 feet in the air to put the instrument up there to see farther. And the target that they were uh, uh, aiming at and pointing at was generally a lit target. It was, uh, you know, just lights aimed at, back at the theodolite 10, 20, or 30 miles away. And they would make those observations at night, all right? And uh, so that's why I've shown you this, the standards of specifications for geodetic control networks. And I'm not going to go to this website now, but I'll, I'll give you the link in the description. You can go to this and it talks about, well, here I've got the station spacing is for first order triangulation is uh, not less than about 10 miles, <clears throat> but you know, they didn't want them any closer, but they would go further if they can. I mean, the idea is to go as far as you can, nominally, let's say, and keep the uh, and and keep these geometric constraints um, uh, in mind as well. Um, what else to say about that? So, I mean, and again, this if you read this, you'll find out it, it was done at night. And again, these are old, man. These are back in the. This is published in '84, but a lot of this goes back into the '30s, the '40s, the '30s, '20s even in the late 1800s and uh, and that's it. So you could, you could do a little research and find out, you know, about your state. I've got the triangulation stations, uh, uh, triangulation diagrams for every state um, and, uh, and all the leveling too. I'm not even talking about leveling right now. There's a whole lot of uh, leveling networks that, that we could be discussing as well. Okay. So now I'm going to talk about observations uh, that I've made. So here, up in New York uh, on Long Island, I went up to this Fire Island uh, lighthouse. And from that lighthouse, I observed the Empire State Building and the Freedom Tower. Now, is that high precision triangulation? No, look at that. Here's the triangulation that they did all along the shore and so forth. And here's this uh, details going across the inlet here. Um, of course, these are longer lines. But generally, your, your lines of triangulation are much shorter. You don't try to reach out 41 miles. You try to do 20 miles. You know, you try to keep it at 10 miles. But I did this for a test. I did this to be able to see the, uh, the Empire State Building and the Freedom Tower. And, I, and, I, and you can go look at that data. Let me click on this. I'll open it up. It'll go to my blog where I post these things. And the link will be in the description box. So you could see basically what I did here, um, the measurements I took. In fact, I did a lot of measurements to the water. Um, I, I took pictures with the theodolite set horizontal, and I uh, measured uh, zenith angles, that's a vertical angle, you know, to the surface of the water. I report the, uh, the measurements. Here's a benchmark that is set up on top of the tower. 
up on top of the lighthouse rather. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm not going to sit here and go through all this, but I'm just showing you this is the type of thing that I'm posting on the blog for anybody to come and look at. And I link to the uh, geodetic control diagram, the geodetic uh, data sheets for these stations. The Empire State Building is a geodetic third order triangulation station. So the coordinates are computed from triangulation measurements. And uh, that's basically it. I just wanted you to see that. You can go and, and look at that. And I think that's it. Uh, that was the point I wanted to make here. So again, it's again, you, now that you understand this curvature idea, consider this. You're looking at this horizontal cross here at elevation 160, let's say. So I'm at that, that cross here is at 160 feet elevation. And look at where it's hitting the Empire State Building. There's the uh, tip of it. So I'm not down at 160 feet above the ground here. I'm way up here. And that's about 41 miles away. What's that mean? What does it tell you? It tells me if I, if I turn this sideways and look on the curvature chart that I was talking about earlier, you're going to see that drop. That's what we're looking at, folks. I hope this is coming through loud and clear. So curvature is uh, measurable. So let's look at this. If I take a carpenter's level and I want to, you know, level up a wall or install a door or something, I want to make sure it's vertical. I want to make sure it's plumb. If I take uh, two levels and put them next to each other, uh, if they are both operational and and then the bubbles are good, they should uh, indicate the same thing close together, right? In fact, if you check the walls of your house from one end to the other, uh, you would hope that they're parallel, right? Um, well, they are in, in that distance. But if you take these two levels and go and, and separate them, and you continue to separate them for, you know, any distance, 1,000 feet, a mile, what have you, um, yeah, if you separate them by, uh, you know, miles, let's say, there's a tilt there. Now, are you going to see that with your eyes? No. This is a good point to bring up that whole conversation where people say, if that, if, if there really is curvature, those buildings should be tilted back. Well, the question is, is can you actually see with your eyes a tilt of half of a degree? No, you wouldn't, you couldn't, you couldn't see that it, it, just looking at it right in your own room. You can't see a half a degree with your eyes and certainly you're not going to see it, uh, you know, 10 or 20 or 30 miles away. You're not going to see something tilting away from you. It's not possible. However, we can measure it. It can be measured. Okay. All you have to do is go out and get a gyromatic curve detector, you know, and that's, that's my sense of humor. There is no such thing as a gyromatic curve detector. Now, it's a high precision theodolite, okay? And when you can, when you have an instrument like this, you can detect the tilt. And that's what I'm going to proceed to show you in the next several slides. Um, it's all based on being able to establish what you would call level and vertical. All right, you've got to understand these basic concepts. And when you put this together, if you can establish the level plane, horizontal plane at your location, if you can affix to this instrument the ability to measure angular change with high precision, like to a one arc second, let's say, or better, and if you can attach a telescope to that with crosshairs in it so you can aim at one object and then turn the instrument to another uh, location, you're going to end up with what we call a surveying theodolite. That's what this thing does. And it, it works on the principle of being able to level it. It has a level bubble right here. And uh, that level vial is used to align the instrument just as you saw 
in that uh, video earlier, which I, I apologize again that the volume was so low on that. But uh, internal, inside this instrument, in, in this casing here is a glass circle that's etched with one second divisions. And down in there, down in here is a glass circle that's etched with uh, one arc second divisions. And of course you've got your, your uh, telescope and it's all aligned in perpendicular fashion. So this is this is it. It's a, this this is the one I'm using. This is the one that was used with for a lot of triangulation. In fact, uh, most of the triangulation was done with a T3, which is a uh, two tenths of a second instrument. So it's even higher precision. So it's an extremely precise uh, tilt sensor. And let's look at this. How do we do it? So if you have these two separated locations and you can measure a zenith angle, the zenith angle is, you know, overhead and you're measuring the zenith angle. It's a, it's a vertical angle, but it's measured where zero is here and 90 is at the horizontal. And of course, if you can measure the zenith angle at the other location, the sum of these two angles is going to be greater than 180 degrees. And that's going to reveal the tilt between the two locations. And if you extend those, those plumb lines downward to where they would intersect, you're, you're actually measuring the delta arc. Okay. And uh, so let's look at that. You may, some of you may have seen this test. I did a one mile test. I actually did it twice. So I did it in 2015 and then I did it again in 2016 on the same points to repeat the test. Uh, and uh, the thing I would always hear about is, oh, a mile's too far. You, you can't go a whole mile. You know, you, you won't be able to see it. Or I, I'm being told, no, it's, it's not far enough. You got to go much farther. So, you know, which is it? Uh, well, in this case, it's, this one's a mile. Okay. And uh, if you compute the difference between the latitudes and longitudes, you get around 50 seconds on the, uh, as a geodetic arc, uh, uncorrected, uh, uncorrected for, um, uh, for, you know, if you just take the raw data without doing any mathematical computation, just go out and measure, you get about a minute here, a minute, 11 seconds, rounded off to a minute. Um, <clears throat> like I said, I went out again the following year, I come up with the same result. And if you go to this video here, on my channel, One Mile Level Line, you'll actually see video that I took through my telescope so you could see. And the one thing that I did differently on the second trip was I made sure that both ends of the line were set at the exact same elevation. So it is a level line, one mile long. And I think, you know, I report the, the results there. And of course, they're on my blog too. So you have all the raw data and, and the results plus the pictures showing you uh, what turns out the fact you can't see it so well in this picture, but go to the blog and you'll see my telescope is here and the target is below the, uh, the horizontal. And how far is it? Does everybody know? What should it be in one mile? Eight inches, right? It's around eight inches. Yeah. And you'll see it plainly in the pictures. So go ahead and take a look. All right. So if one mile is not, not good enough, how about uh, nearly uh, 60 miles, around 60 miles, 92K. Here's a report of the uh, survey they did at the McDonald Observatory, this radial line scheme. It looks like this. They measured these very long lines in, in all these directions, okay? And uh, I went to the National Geodetic Survey. I went down there and, uh, whoops, yeah, I went and looked at the, uh, the field books. Uh, and looked at them and actually got a lot of this data myself. And here's where they actually recorded all their zenith angles. And there were boxes of these books. And here's some pictures of the guys doing this stuff. Um, that's a T3. And here's the interesting thing. I mean, they were measuring reciprocal zenith angles. That means 
the guy up here at the far station is measuring back to the center station back here. So there's a guy here and there's a guy here and they are measuring to each other zenith angles. Same thing. They now, it's, now they do this line. So the guy's sitting here inside that little hut they made to stay out of the sun and th this guy over here and they're measuring to each other simultaneously. All right. So let me go back to here. Sorry. For, sorry for all the Okay, someone's asking 52 arc seconds per mile average. <clears throat> I'm going to have to <coughs> get back to that, Thomas. <coughs> Pardon me. Uh, okay, let me continue here with this. Um, so this is the Wild Herebrook T3. It's a 0.2 second instrument. And, um, you know, this is the I'll put this uh, link in the uh, description so you can go and look at this. They were recording um, temperature and pressure readings continuously throughout this whole uh, scheme. Now, I went ahead and took all those observations from the report, input it into my software, and basically recreated the uh, project. Okay, and you know there, there that's what it looks like in uh, Google Earth. <coughs> Pardon me get a drink here. So just uh, looking at the longest line from point one to four, um, I'm going to do some calculations on that. Basically here I've got a tabulation of the sum of the zenith angles, or what they call the zenith distances. And you can see that they are clearly up over uh, 180 by quite a bit. So in a mile, I had about a minute uh, across 57 miles uh, they had about 44 minutes and 33 seconds. And each one of these is a geodetic station that you can go look up and get the uh, actual uh, uh, data sheet for. Like here's Station Baldy. You, know, you can get, get all the data for these stations. And that's the uh, link for looking up uh, NGS triangulation or, you know, uh, geodetic control stations. So let's get to this. Um, the latitudes and longitudes at each end, you can inverse that. In other words, you know, find out the delta arc between there. That's what it would be uh, geodetically. And it's 50 minutes. They were measuring um, 44 minutes, 33 seconds. So there's a lot of computations involved here, uh, which I'm not, you know, I'm not going to go into. I'm trying to keep this as simply as possible, but I just want to give, give you uh, some information here. You wouldn't otherwise know you you you're not hearing of this you're he, you're seeing all these memes about where's the curve where's the curve all right so i'm only going into this in enough detail that to show you that this stuff is out there and if you want to really dig in you can you can really dig in deeply you can find out and learn what is the uh, deflection of the vertical you know what is the ellipsoid what's the geoid um, you know why why is it different here and here well, there's reasons for it, uh, and you know I'm not I, I don't have the time to go into all that. Maybe another video, but know this: these are the actual observations made, and and that's what they saw, and that's what I see in my observations. Any surveyor can make these observations themselves. This is a calibration baseline program. All surveyors have to calibrate their EDM on a known baseline, a baseline that has, uh, f you know, marks in the ground, there's monuments in the ground with published data. So you can go here and you can look it up and you can find out what is the published distance from mark to mark or horizontally. You know, there's the mark to mark distance and it was measured with a high precision instrument numerous times and there's the standard error is at 0.1 millimeters. So there's high precision involved here to create a uh, truth standard that you can compare your instrument to to make sure it's working properly. Well, if you go out here, like I did, I went out here on this one particular line. Here it is in uh, Google Earth. You got a zero meters, 150 meters, 425 meters, and 1100 meters. So, and they're all all on the same line. That means you got to put your instrument here, put it here, put it here. And put it here and measure the distances but 
the interesting thing for this presentation is the zenith angles, the uh, the you know the vertical angles between these stations, they're not going to add up to 180 degrees. And and so take a look. And this is sorry sorry for this lousy sketch, but I scribbled this up in the hotel room, and uh, you're looking at. Well, here I, I actually transcribed it for you. <laughs> so over the 1,100 meters, you've got uh, 29 arc seconds. In this segment here, you're looking at 14 seconds. And even in 150 meters, there's nine seconds. It happens that a lot of these calibration baselines, the two endpoints are uh, geodetically positioned so that you have latitude and longitude. And you can compute the uh, inverse arc there. And in this case, it's about 35 seconds. So I got a pretty good match here. You got 35 seconds to 29 seconds. Again, that's the raw observation. This is uh, inversing between these published uh, values. So I think it's very, you know, it verifies the result. How about 500 feet? You know, so we've looked at 60 miles. We looked at a mile. We've looked at, uh, you know, a kilometer. Here's 500 feet. And notice I, I did this one in two directions. I'm always interested to know is, are we are we seeing consistent results in different in, in two directions? Here's a, a little test I did. Here's all my uh, observations. It's out here at a a, a parking lot, and uh, here's the instrument set up, and you can see the target off in the distance. Let me zoom in there, so you can see that target, and. Um, I'm just showing you little snippets of my field notes. So I measured uh, six seconds here and seven seconds uh, on, on this line. Uh, I did establish the geodetic positions of those and uh, the, the inverse of those arcs. I have pretty good agreement, uh, four seconds to six and, and five to, to, to seven there. So, you know, again, the trend is there. You're not you're not seeing a huge discrepancy there. And let's talk about a leveling instrument. Now I'm going to show you why th this is has meaning for you who anybody who's interested in maybe performing some tests of their own uh, and might be intimidated by a theodolite or a or a total station. These electronic type instruments. Um, if, if this, uh, you know, is intimidating to be able to learn how to measure angles, but, you know, because it, it takes time to be able to do this with proficiency and repeatability, I'm suggesting to go ahead and rent one of these very simple instruments called an auto level. Um, it's going to do a, this for you. It's going to just establish the horizontal plane, a horizontal plane line of sight. This instrument is used to put up a, uh, uh, you know, above ground pool, uh, put on addition to your house, uh, do construction, you know, f f it's used a lot. I mean, that's what it's used for. It's just to deter determine difference in elevation on a construction site. Um, and it's really simple to set up. It just has a bullseye level. That's all you have to do. Get that bubble into the red circle. And the internal compensator is going to take over and establish that for you. And that's it. Now, once you do that, and, and here I'm going to show you an example of, of actually doing this. I took this auto level up onto that fire tower, and here it is. Uh, I'm actually looking out towards the city of Philadelphia, which you can't see there, but it's out there. And I took a picture through the telescope, and, uh, you know, that's the city of Philadelphia, and... This is where the curvature drop is measured down from. Okay. And uh, I put this here just for the fun of it because I, I get comments back that I'm not zooming in close enough. Well, I'm not trying to zoom in close. There's no reason to zoom in close. I'm just trying to establish the horizontal plane. Zooming in close is just going to give me a closer view of the city, but I'm still going to see the telescope crosshair going across the building. So 
this is this is funny and but it would what it does remind me of is the nikon uh, p900 which has a virtual horizon feature that uh, I, I i don't know if anybody's trying to use that or not but uh you know if you are going out taking pictures with these cameras at, at huge distances make, make sure you use the virtual horizon so you could establish the horizontal plane you know because you, you, you can't do it with your eyes you can't look out and know that is it up or down or is it level or not? So now here's a shot I took using an app on my iPhone called Theatolite. And uh, you can load that and it uses the tilt sensor that is in the iPhone. All right. And uh, this was, this is taken from a, a place called Washington Rock Park. And that's why that's uh, New York City. There's my Theatolite there. I'm just kind of up close to it, near to it. Just taking this picture and I I obviously wasn't uh, I was 0.4 degrees I don't know I, I, I think I'm aiming uh, I'm not quite at zero am I um, so anyway that's another thing you can try using and uh, and I think I'm getting to the end of the presentation where I just want to show you the results of these measurements made at the Delaware Bay uh, and, and again, here you're looking at a triangulation diagram. So you could see all the lines, the very long lines they observed long ago, back in the 20s, 30s, or whenever they whenever they did this work. And I'm measuring to these three lighthouses. Uh, and here are the results. And what I show you here is where I'm set up, the elevation of my cross here. I'm just rounding off to 12 feet, okay? You know, it's at, it's at 11.6, but for this tabulation, I'm just rounding it off. I've got the three lighthouses out here. This one here is a 14-foot bank light. So that's this one. And uh, if you use the elevation, just estimating from the nautical chart, because I've not determined the elevation of that thing. I'm just assuming that the nautical chart has it right. And um, the delta elevation is the fact that that thing should be 51 feet higher than my crosshair, but uh, it's obviously lower. Um, the curvature is computed over that distance of 8.5 miles. So again, it's seven minutes and 23 seconds. Are you really gonna ask me that, you know, why can't I see that that should be tilted back by seven minutes? You know, it's not a valid question. You, you cannot see a tilt of seven minutes. You can't. Uh, okay, there's the distance and of course the uh, Curvature drop just using the eight inches times the mile squared. Um, I think that is, oh, and then of course, I'm just showing you where you can take a look at that data. And again, I'll, I'll post the link in the description. This might be the last slide. Yeah, so just recording what happened here. And again, the uh, everything's linked. You can, uh, get the um, uh, data sheet for each one and you can also click on each lighthouse so it brings you to a, a page that describes that structure so you can see a picture of it up close and hopefully this presentation got across the idea of how you can you know think about curvature uh, you know uh, different than some of these memes you're looking at and uh, and that's it. Uh, that's all for now. Maybe uh, I, I, again. <laughs> okay, I got a I got a message texted here. Let's see. Let me think of two millimeter laser dot at ten feet. Uh, I'm going to try to see the chat window. Maybe I sh maybe I can try that. If I, if I do this, it's just going to be infinity like crazy. Maybe I should stop sharing the screen. Okay. Now maybe I can see the chat window. Oh, I do. I see a chat window, but I don't see anything in it. 
Okay, I'm going to... Uh, I'm going to just... Uh, hey, listen, folks. I, I'm happy you all... You know, I don't know how many of you are even watching this. Um, this is the second one I've done. And uh, I'm just trying to get better and smoother or less choppy, <laughs> a little more organized. It's a lot of information. I, I want to present it in a way that I'm not going into too much detail because, you know, you just lose people. Um, I, uh, I just want to give enough that you're not seeing anywhere else. Okay. So, you know, when you're looking at all these memes, they can be convincing, but some of them are just not legit at all. And the, the best one is where they show the horizon and, and they go, it's not called, it's not, it's sea level, not sea curve. I mean, some of this stuff is just dumb, you know, and uh, of course there's a lot of memes to combat those. So let's, uh, let's get beyond the memes and let's get into some real meat. Um, the, uh, the talk we did two days ago, I, I provided a, quite a bit of information that you can go and look up you know, all the standards and specifications for how surveying is done. I mean, are we really saying that perspective, <laughs> ramped perspective, has uh, somehow affected surveying measurements to the point that they're wrong? Are all these positions wrong? You know, if you get a nautical chart where you live and you're going to go boating and it says that there's a lighthouse here and a beacon and it gives you the position of it, is it reliable? <laughs> So you got to get to the reality of this. I mean, you, you, know, you know, when you look at that uh, meme of the long, long bridge, right? Um, is the bridge really there? I mean, did they build it correctly? And is it mapped correctly? Is it shown on your nautical chart so that you don't run into any of the, uh, you know, <laughs> the, the columns? Um, you know, this, you know, you can think of so many examples. So, you know, um, that's it. I, I think I'll, End it here. How long have we been going for? What time is it? Oh, it's about an, about an hour. We're five minutes till an hour. Um, thanks for showing up, and uh, this will be on the this will be up on my channel. And uh, <laughs> sayonara. I'll talk to you later.